ahead and get started. Uh, good morning or good afternoon, wherever you might be. My name is Omar Siddiqui of uh, the Electric Power, Institute, Electric Power Research Institute. And on behalf of my colleague, Liang Min from uh, Stanford Bits and Watts Initiative, I'd like to welcome you all to this week's Digital Grid uh, Summer Webinar. And this is part of our continuing uh, webinar series. Um, and today's uh, panel is on uh, the topic of open standards data platforms. And we're delighted to have our, our panel here. Um, a few things to go over uh, by way of, of housekeeping and uh, orientation before we begin. And uh, just to let everyone know, we are currently, we do have all the attendees on mute, uh, given the size that we expect to have uh, for, this, uh, for this webinar. Uh, but we do want this to be interactive, and there are multiple ways uh, for you to do that. Uh, we highly recommend uh, for you to ask questions and uh, provide comments through the chat feature. And you can access this if you look at the bottom of your, um, web, uh, of your web panel. There's a little cloud there. That's the chat function. You can click that and uh, uh, send questions or comments that way. Uh, you can also use the Q&A feature that you will see on your um, right-hand side. That's another uh, a panel, and you can direct questions to uh, individual panelists or to all panelists uh, at, 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 la at large, and then we will uh, read those questions uh, as they, um, uh, when we come to natural breakpoints. And you can also uh, raise your virtual hand to ask a question. Uh, we are recording this session, and your participation is your uh, consent to be a part of this recording. And we will be posting, after the fact, uh, the presentations along with the recordings uh, at the EPRI and Stanford um, uh, appropriate websites, and uh, there will be some more information about that. So we look forward to your uh, active uh, engagement and participation in this. A uh, brief word about... Uh, our hosts, uh, EPRI, we are an independent not-for-profit research organization. Our research focus is on uh, all aspects of the electric power uh, uh, business, uh, from generation to delivery to end use, and it's for the public benefit. And our mission is to advance uh, electric service to keep it safe, affordable, reliable, and environmentally responsible in a collaborative fashion. And on that collaborative note, we are delighted to have been partnering uh, with Stanford's Bits and Watts Initiative. It's a major initiative at Stanford focused on innovations for the future grid, uh, and its, span, its scope includes business innovations, policies, and technologies, particularly on uh, between the consumer and the grid. Uh, so it's a great fit, and uh, it's been a wonderful series uh, that, we, that we've had. So uh, the objective that we have for this whole series uh, in, including uh, this panel, certainly, is to convene experts across multiple disciplines to exchange views of what a, a shared integrated digital grid uh, means, what it represents. And you see there on the graphic uh, on the right, different aspects that uh, can constitute aspects of uh, the, the digital grid. And we've had uh, panels that have been focused on uh, various aspects of this or have been looking at these uh, in a cross-cutting manner. Uh, and the objective is to help identify gaps towards achieving this vision of a, of a uh, shared integrated digital grid. And one of the principal uh, themes that, have, that has been uh, you know, present throughout is to have enabling data platforms uh, that can provide the kind of uh, connection between uh, particularly behind the meter customer devices and the grid. And that's certainly um, something of keen focus for today's panel. Uh, to understand industry requirements on the utility side, understand the perspectives of technology providers and others in the technology ecosystem to enable solutions, and then to discuss how to bridge these gaps. Uh, ultimately, we look at this series as a means to help inform a research roadmap and a collaborative research initiative that EPRI is looking to undertake uh, with utility uh, support, but with the advice of this you know, broader ecosystem of people that we brought together through these, this series. And when we speak of um, a shared integrated digital grid, uh, one of the principal uh, identifying characteristics of this is the ability to seamlessly integrate customer resources, behind the meter resources, as assets that can help optimize grid flexibility without compromising the customer experience in the process. And so this is uh, uh, 
getting to this end state is uh, really what we want to work backwards from to see what it will take and what gaps need to be addressed. With that, I'd like to turn it over to uh, Liang Min to talk a bit more about our workshop and uh, <clears throat> introduce today's panel. Thank you, Omar. And uh, uh, good morning, and I believe most of us do good morning or good evening for the folks in European countries, and uh, welcome to uh, this week's webinar. Just a quick recap and uh, walk us through that what we have discussed. We have been doing that for almost uh, uh, seven to eight weeks, and have conducted about 10 webinars in the last uh, eight weeks. In, the, in June and July, we uh, focus on different uh, player or category of the players in, in this field. We had the panel talk about U.S. utility practice, European utility practice, and also the IT company like uh, Google, Microsoft, Intel, how they uh, think about and how they uh, practice in this area. Then we have a university panel, we have a startup panel, we have a federal state government panel, corporate research center panel. Then in the end of last month, July, we uh, did a polling in terms of the interesting challenges and topics uh, audience would like to see in this month. And based on the polling results, what we organized for this month is has a resilient discussion we had two weeks ago and had a wholesale market discussion we had last week. Today, we're going to discuss open and standardized data platform topic. And uh, last but not least, uh, in the end of this month, we're going to partner with Great Wise Architecture Council uh, to discuss the transactive energy, which is also um, has been raised a couple of times uh, during this webinar series. So without further ado, I'd like to uh, introduce today's distinguished speakers. And uh, we have Julie Goodman from LF Energy, a Linux Foundation project. And we have uh, JC Morris from Energy Web Foundation and uh, Michael Russell from Unreal. So Shuri and JC, they are going to talk about the open source data platform efforts they have been doing on their organizations. Then, you know, any open source data platform, we need to have the source of the data. So Michael is going to discuss some of the open source data initiative had at National Lab Complex. So I will quickly introduce their background as each of them has extensive background in this area. So Shuri Goodman is a founder and executive director of LF Energy, which is a Linux Foundation project. It provides and supports open source innovation in the energy and the electricity sectors. LF Energy's goal is to accelerate the energy transition and decarbonization. Having spent the early part of uh, her career enabling some of the largest companies in the world to become internet ready, Shuri has brought her digital first cross industry background to the electricity sector. With a doctor in organization systems, focused on innovation and energy transition, Shuri has a very unique and a multidisciplinary approach to solving complex problems. She has a very ambitious goal, which I like the most. The goal is to inspire, train, and enable more than 10,000 developers in the next 10 years to digitally transform electrical power system. Our second speaker is Jesse Morris. Jesse is the co-founder and the chief commercial officer of Energy Web Foundation. Throughout his career in the electricity sector, Jesse also has one focus, which I like a lot as well. Partnering with utility, technology provider, developers, and the regulatory stakeholder to help distribute any resource become an integral and a widely accessible part for the ecosystem. Before Energy Web Foundation, JC was the principal in the electricity practice of a Rocky Mountain Institute. During his time at Rocky Mountain, JC's work focused on the fundamental economics of DER and the ability to provide a different service to the electrical grid through regulatory changes and new business models. Last but not least, Michael. Michael Russell is a member of Unreal's 
data group stands for data analysis tools and application. He is the data lead for several very important renewable data sources, which include National Solar Radiation Database, Wind Integration National Database, so-called Wind Toolkit. His work is focused on creating, managing, and distributing unreal state-of-art renewable resource data through different platforms, which includes a collaboration with HDF, stands for Hierarchical Data Format Group, and the Amazon Web, Web Service to make the, uh, these two data sets public available. Right now, he's also working very closely and expanded his expertise to the cloud computing and AI through the partnership and new venture with Google uh, through several machine learning projects. So with that, let's have a shooting to kick off today's conversation. Hi, everyone. There's some folks I see in the attendee list. It's really wonderful to uh, see you all here. It's very exciting. You know, one of the things that I, I really want to start with, um, I live right now at the edge of three fires where everybody has been evacuated. And my air is uh, um, ash. And I also had to be part of a series of rolling blackouts. And so, you know, I, I think that as we move forward through this conversation, and I'm so excited for this opportunity for Omar, Arlie, Lane, and Jesse, and Michael to be able to have this conversation. Um, you know, I really also think that we can get very present in our reality because the more that we allow our current environment to inform, you know, kind of our steering in the direction that we take and moving forward, um, I think the most smarter will be. So um, if, if my internet drops, uh, you'll note that it may have something to do with what's going on in Sonoma County right now. Okay, so LF Energy, I think all of us know that the world around us has changed with regards to energy. I'm going to move relatively quickly through a series of slides, and uh, I will be looking at the Q&A in the chat, so if there's some question that you have or something that you want me to go into, please let me know. Um, and uh, But what I want to do is be able to move through this relatively quickly so that I can build a foundation for a conversation that we have all together. Um, so, you know, in, in a nutshell, uh, the role of LF Energy is to provide a 21st century plan of action around decarbonization and open source. Uh, open source, from my perspective, is really, uh, it's, it's an intellectual property convenience, um, and it allows for multiple investments I have Siri talking to me, excuse me. Um, we have, you know, um, multiple uh, stakeholders being able to invest. And as I have seen LF Energy emerge, more and more I recognize um, that in many ways, what we're going to be doing is building the reference architectures and the open frameworks um, and actually creating the software for the future. Because I don't think it exists, although I think the building blocks exist. Um, so my background, um, you know, I do feel like I've been in the deep end of the ocean, um, but my background really is as an innovation person and an adoption person and a stakeholder and governance person. So this is what I would refer to as a, you know, typical technology adoption curve. And I, my guess is that most of you, this is familiar to you. Um, this is the challenge for decarbonization. Our adoption rate right now, if we start right now and focus all of our energy, is at about 9% annual um, for the next 30 years in terms of transitioning uh, from fossil fuel and for decarbonizing. And for every year that we postpone that, uh, the curve gets steeper and steeper. So if we wait five or seven years, 10 years, um, you know, we're gonna start having adoption curves that are like 25% a year. And of course, that's going to be agonizing and um, probably impossible. Um, and you know, the, the the impact is not only are we going to see disruption, but the planet is going to get smaller. The livable planet is going to get simply is going to get smaller, even if we start today. So this is the vision for LF Energy. Um, this is what my members, how my members talk about it. 
um, is this notion that the grid is composed of loosely coupled systems. And how they are thinking about digitalization is that um, it enables engineers and markets to make high impact changes frequently and predictably with minimal toil. And I think that if you're sitting in California right now, or you're sitting in Sonoma County, from my perspective, we need to do this now. Um, because when I think about what's been happening in California, particularly with the rollouts, it's not just that we have not a battery capacity or storage to offset. We are also, um, we have not um, really updated uh, our regulatory frameworks with regards to markets. We are not enabling flexibility um, and we are not really sharing data modeling and AI and machine learning in a way that allows us to really optimize the grid um, in the ways that we need to. And I believe that open source is probably the only way that we can do it. So isolation and going it alone are no longer viable. We need speed scale, enhanced security, accelerated innovation and global talent. And I think we need mass collaboration. We, we have to figure out how to work together. There is only one way through this. I think COVID is an incredible object lesson as painful as it has been to America and to American exceptionalism. It really is an indication if we have a patchwork response to climate collapse, if we have a patchwork response to the energy transition, um, we are going, it's going to look like COVID and our response to COVID. So I really want to encourage us to figure out how to get past um, whatever it is that keeps us from working really closely together and seeing the opportunity. So from where I sit, the Linux Foundation is one of the greatest organizations on the planet. It is the home of, uh, you know, it was 250 plant, uh, projects about a year ago. Um, I think we're now up to about 384. And, um, and we have thousands of members from all over the planet. And they're working on the shared foundations for technology. So whether it is in telecommunications or it is automotive or it is cloud native or it is energy or it is blockchain, we are working together as communities in open ecosystems to fundamentally transform the either technology stack that we're working on or the industries that we're working in. It's the world's dominant open source platform. Not that I think that one needs to dominate, um, but I do think that there is an importance in being able to build and facilitate community, particularly when we get to energy, because the blocks, the technology blocks exist. Um, they need to be composed in reference architectures by those people who are responsible uh, for securing the grid and for providing uh, energy um, as we uh, transform uh, the world and electrify everything. So last summer, we started an, an initiative with high, medium, and low voltage um, uh, enterprise architects, along with architects from the aggregation and generation space. And, and we came up with a functional architecture. And the reason why a functional architecture is important, and, and this is kind of where I'm taking my comments uh, towards conclusion, is that what we're talking about here is a taxonomy. And that taxonomy allows us to really envision and imagine the complexity of, um, of, of, you know, the effort that we're all engaged in. And so what they did was that they, they took kind of across high, medium, and low voltage generation and aggregation behind the meter. Um, we took input from many, many, you know, maybe 70, 80 folks. This is uh, sitting on the internet. It is Creative Commons. Anyone can use this taxonomy, and we certainly want you to participate in it. And then they went down another level, and they put the boxes in, uh, you, know, the, you know, the core uh, kind of functional components of these systems. And then they went even farther. They went down, and they began to address, um, you know, the actual kind of uh, either applications or platforms that are essential. So whether it's consent management, which is like Green Button or S Feed in Europe, or whether it's modeling and simulation software, or whether it's asset supervision or edge node control, um, what we have here is a three-level taxonomy around which we can begin to build reference architectures. Um, 
and then we dropped in our projects and the and the various different um, uh, initiatives. Uh, we have a, a lot of software coming into um, the Linux Foundation this fall, um, including an electric mobility project um, that uh, is being put in um, by uh, the Netherlands. And the Netherlands, I think, if anyone here has, uh, you know, I know Sabine is here, you know, I'm blown away by um, the work that they have done with regards to congestion management, uh, flexibility services, um, open markets, and the ability to be able to onboard um, electric mobility in a way that um, enables the grid as opposed to um, actually um, causes um, irreparable problems. So these are our projects. Um, the other thing that we started doing when we, um, you know, we we did kind of a, a, a the next version of of the taxonomy. We did in once we started working from home, and we ran uh, three six month sprints, three six week sprints. Um, and again, there were probably about 140 folks, mostly enterprise architects, who participated. Um, and what came out of it was the recognition that for all the projects, we also needed frameworks. And it's not just a functional architecture framework and the understanding of the interconnection of these things, um, but also the data architecture, um, uh, the infrastructure, meaning cloud and cloud native microservices and a security framework. And so we have uh, two chairs for each of these uh, uh, architectures or frameworks and these are integrated into our governance model where we have our technical advisory council all of these projects are together um, plus the the chairs uh, for the frameworks they are non-voting members of the TAC and the reason why this is important is that um, I believe that in order to be able to go faster um, we need to have kind of both oars in the water is the way I describe it um, for each of these four frameworks, um, because it will make scaling um, better, e easier, faster, um, more, uh, more smart. Um, and you'll see there the project on the left is Open Energy Data Initiative. That, that is what Michael is going to be representing. Um, so the NREL project is one of our projects. And uh, so I'm really excited to hear from him in terms of updating. Um, uh, I'm going to close, I think I'm closing um, with the next two slides, but <clears throat> um, this is the very, very beginning of the LF Energy Energies landscape. And I think if you were to go out and Google uh, Cloud Native Computing Foundation and their landscape or LF um, AI and their landscape, what you see is uh, some folks who are a couple of years ahead of us um, who have begun to populate the software that fills out these blocks. And these blocks are really organized around the taxonomy. Um, there's a link here. <clears throat> this presentation will be made available. Please go to this spreadsheet and put your software in. Um, let us know the license and please give us a link to an SVG so that we can have uh, the right logo. Um, but uh, this is one of our grand projects, um, and it, it really is making sure that we actually begin to catalyze and catalog and organize the reference architectures that represent the grid of the future. These are our members. Um, we have a, a host of members that are going to come in in the next uh, few weeks, um, even in a downturn market. Um, we've had uh, actual, actually considerable growth, including GE and I. I think I saw uh, uh, John McDonald here. And uh, so thank you very much um, for, uh, you know, all of our members for participating. Uh, this is a, uh, a, a, um, a grand challenge that we're all engaged in. And um, I see, I think if you look at the right hand bottom corner, the power of together, that really is how we're moving forward. Um, with this and, you know, this taxonomy exercise is really around, it's kind of like organizing our sock drawer, you know, there's a lot of stuff all over the place, particularly the labs in the U.S., um, but there's a lot of stuff. Let's get it out there. Let's get it organized in one place so that we can begin seeing where we need to be investing and how to compose the grid of the future based on what we um, have already begun working on. 
Um, this is how to get in touch with me. Um, our website, we have a new website coming up. Uh, and uh, what's not on here is our wiki and it's uh, wiki.lfenergy.org. And that is where all of the project work is being done right now and uh, where we're putting considerable uh, investment so that um, these reference architectures and these groups can be made as transparent as possible. Thank you very much. Thank you, Shirley, appreciate Great. it. And uh, uh, now, just a quick reminder for all the audience, you can type your question through uh, the chat or the Q&A function uh, down below then uh, uh, all the panelists, they are able to see your questions. And Omar and I are going to monitor these questions closely. And uh, we will make sure that we will have ample time uh, in the end for the Q&A. Uh, next, we're going to have uh, JC Morris from Energy Web Foundation to share his perspective. JC, floor is yours. Great. Thanks, Liang, and thanks both to EFRI and uh, Bits and Watts for inviting Energy Web to be here. Uh, always great to be on a panel and speaking with folks like uh, the groups from NREL and uh, the Linux Foundation and LF Energy. We are on the same team to try and accelerate the energy transition here. And I'll also say, um, Shuli's point about being grounded in the moment is very relevant. I, too, am sitting on coastal California. Uh, three towns were just evacuated just up the road from me, about five miles. So uh, from, again, fires, I was also uh, lucky enough to be part of those rolling blackouts that just happened. So uh, yes, this isn't just software we're talking about. This is real world uh, impacts on our lives. So I think it's always important to, to bring that home. So in terms of what I'd like to spend a few minutes talking about with the group before we uh, hand it over to NREL and then have a discussion, um, I wanna drill in a little bit on exactly what we're doing with Energy Web from a technology perspective and uh, how to think about uh, our technology stack relative to this concept of open data platforms. Um, and by doing that, I do want to talk specifically uh, under the covers, how does decentral technology work? I'm sure a lot of people on this line have heard about blockchain technology. A lot of people on this line are interested in bringing open source kind of um, software to market to accelerate the energy transition. Uh, for, for me, in, in, in our experience at Energy Web, I think it's really important to double click underneath uh, some of these more conceptual discussions and really understand how some of this technology works to see what the future could potentially look like. So that's mostly what I'll be focused on. And specifically, I will leave you with two kind of very specific project-based examples um, of what I'm talking about here. So first, uh, what is Energy Web? So Energy Web Foundation is a global nonprofit organization, um, and we really launched it uh, in one way to help grid operators in particular, so transmission system operators, distribution system operators, vertically integrated utilities, to help them transform the way that they run 21st century energy markets and programs. And again, our mission is to develop and deploy what we call a decentralized digital operating system uh, for the energy sector in support of a low carbon energy future. So that's really our mission and focus. And to just put that mission in perspective, I think it is always useful to ground everybody in what is the current status of the energy transition? Uh, why do we need uh, everything that I'm about to speak about and what Julie was talking about in terms of open source software to help run this new system? It's really important to get the context here. So. Uh, We've talked about and used these numbers before. I actually realized just before this presentation, we should probably update these for 2020 because these numbers have gone up on the customer side. But the point here is that we, the people on this line, whether we're residential customers, commercial and industrial customers that use electricity and energy, we're gonna soon be spending more on the energy system than traditional utilities who spend uh, somewhere between seven and 800 billion a year on the mix of transmission, distribution, and uh, generation globally. So that's, that's an amazing transformation that all of that capital, this, this kind of capital shift, shifts towards customers. And really for us at Energy Web, um, these assets, whether we're talking about stationary storage systems, electric vehicles, electric vehicle charging stations, smart thermostats, heat pumps, large scale solar facilities, uh, rooftop so solar facilities, wind facilities, these are the assets that are going to form the basis of a broadly decarbonized energy sector. The trick is, at least from the Energy Web perspective, 
is that that kind of ecosystem where customers are the primary investors in all of these assets, and those assets form the basis of the grid, uh, grid operators are, are more or less unequipped to procure services from those assets. And that's because the kind of architecture that we're naturally moving towards um, is a total opposite from the 20th century model for the power system, where grid operators on the left of this chart in a centralized top-down manner registered and integrated and operated a relatively small number of really large thermal assets. But the system we're moving towards is, is just totally different, where we have a decentralized uh, model with thousands, tens of thousands, millions, eventually billions of small scale assets that can actually be providing the same services that large scale generators uh, provided in the 20th century model. And this is our focus at Energy Web, is providing a completely open source, decentralized software infrastructure to enable grid operators to actually thrive in this kind of new grid architecture and environment. So that's our focus. The way that we fulfill our mission about decarbonization and enabling this architecture is to very specifically, and this is why I was so glad to see the, the EFRI upfront slides here presenting their focus, um, we want to enable any device owned by any customer to participate in any kind of energy market. If I had to distill what we're doing at Energy Web down into one sentence, that would be it. And to break down specifically what I mean there, um, let's go to the bottom of this chart. As I just talked through, there are customers all across the world investing at scale in clean tech, in renewable energy assets. And those assets, in a lot of cases, um, actually have a lot of intelligence and software layered around them. And different combinations of manufacturers, aggregators, retailers, and even some sophisticated customers, they're able to actually operate those assets in really sophisticated ways at that customer and asset layer. Then at the top, we have hundreds, if not thousands, of different kinds of energy markets and operational procedures to actually manage the electric grid. And we could be talking about wholesale markets. We could be talking about um, potential distribution level markets for electricity. Uh, we could talk about energy attribute certificates that are used to show corporates uh, their relative contribution to where they're purchasing green energy from. So there's those markets, those assets. What we try and provide at Energy Web is this global open source digital infrastructure layer that is really focused on uh, establishing identity for assets and their owners, uh, permissions. So what are those assets allowed to do? How is data allowed to be shared between those assets? And relationships between those assets. And to just make this a little bit more real, um, I think this slide just helps make it a, a bit more specific. So at the top, those are logos of a number of grid operators who are in the energy web ecosystem that we're working with on a day-to-day -day basis. And we're trying to help them deploy new markets for all of these assets to participate in. So we provide that digital infrastructure layer in between. At the bottom, again, there are a number of very large, sophisticated organizations that are already manufacturing and deploying uh, tens of thousands and soon to be millions of uh, clean energy assets, whether we're talking about Tesla, Sun, and uh, Vestas, General Electric, just as examples. Those assets are already being deployed. We try and provide the digital infrastructure for those assets to be seamlessly and easily integrated into these grid operator systems. And I would be remiss if I didn't connect this architecture to what just happened in California, which as, a, as somebody who's been working on the energy transition for 10 years was unbelievably frustrating to be sitting here in one of the richest countries in the world, in one of the richest states, California, uh, in the US, and to have these rolling blackouts happen when consider the following. On my block, there are tens of electric vehicles, multiple power walls sitting in the basement of these homes, flexible commercial and industrial load across the way. And those assets collectively absolutely could have been helping the California system operator meet its shortfall in capacity, which triggered these rolling blackouts. Those assets weren't participating in the market. And that's not because there aren't current pathways to doing so. In California, we have things like the proxy demand response program, the, uh, uh, the DRAM, the uh, demand response auction mechanism, and some other platforms. But the current ways that assets, like the ones I'm rambling about here, 
are enabled to access those markets um, simply aren't uh, using 21st century technology. With what we're doing at Energy Web, and even with what some of the projects that truly articulated is going on at LF Energy, we have the opportunity for every single DER that has some base level of intelligence in California to be digitized and registered and integrated and providing capacity to the California system operator. And as somebody who has been in this space for 10 years, again, it is just unbelievably frustrating to see that we haven't gotten to the point that all of these assets that are already on the ground aren't being fully utilized to prevent the kinds of things that just happened uh, in terms of these rolling blackouts. So I'll get off of my soapbox, but just being a part of that and in this space, you can't help but be a little bit frustrated. So I want to talk a little bit about what that would look like. How could we enable every DER in California to participate in all of these different energy markets, whether we're talking about wholesale, whether we're talking about local distribution level demand response programs, and our tech stack achieves that, and it's called the Energy Web Decentralized Operating System. So this is an open source stack. Um, it has a lot of different modules and components that are all open source, and we also do use blockchain technology. In this case, uh, we use something called the Energy Web Chain uh, that I'll speak about in a moment. But before kind of drilling down into functionally how it works, let's just use some simple analogies that we've had experience with that I think helps people understand what's going on here. So first, uh, the way this tech stack works is every single DER, every single customer, every single market participant and authority and manufacturer and even aggregator gets a digital identity. And you could think of that digital identity like a passport. And that passport just has certain specific verified information about that identity. What is it? How much power can it jam through? Uh, what markets is it actually allowed to participate in? Which is some of the information being shown on this graphic right here. But then if we go to the next step, we take all of those identities, which on this chart are on the left. So you see a battery, an electric vehicle, a solar system, a customer, a smart building. Those digital identities are then authenticated and authorized to participate in different markets. And um, this is the basis upon which every single application in our ecosystem uh, is being built on. And this, on this kind of approach, this architecture for the future grid creates an immense amount of value because it enables DERs to be integrated and digitized and operationalized with grid operators at ultra low cost with maximum interoperability. And it has the ability to protect customer data privacy because it's using an open source decentralized architecture underneath. So there's a lot of buzzwords. Let's just get into a couple of really specific examples to show what this architecture looks like uh, in practice. So this chart is showing the two kind of use cases that the Energy Web Decentralized Operating System typically supports. On the left, at a high level, um, think of it as flex. So again, enabling DERs to be digitized, integrated, and coordinated to enable DERs to be utilized to their full potential. And what's shown on here are a couple of examples from across the world where we are bringing to market these kinds of flexibility platforms on the operating system. On the right, slightly different use case, it's about using the same technology stack um, to support something we call origin, which is about tracing, tracking, and trading really granular environmental energy attribute certificates. And we've got a number of examples from the energy web ecosystem shown here, uh, just talking a bit about what that looks like. So I just wanna provide two specific examples uh, before I pass it off uh, to the next speaker. So first I wanna talk about our friends on the other side of the Atlantic uh, in Austria. Um, so this is the transmission system operator in Austria called Austria Power Grid. One of the earliest energy web supporters and members, uh, a really progressive thinker in terms of uh, how can open source decentralized architectures transform energy. And what we supported APG in doing is just what I talked about. So giving customer owned DERs a digital identity, enabling those identities to be authenticated. Uh, and when I say authenticated, literally, okay, I am a battery sitting in Jesse's basement with the following attributes and then some other market participant. Uh, in this case, it was the DER installers themselves are certifying that yes, that battery in Jesse's basement is what it says it is and is capable of doing what it says it's capable of doing. So we actually enabled those identities to be authenticated. And then once authenticated, those identities are automatically um, digitized and integrated with the transmission system operators operations. 
And in this case, this is what the wireframe kind of um, chart uh, is being shown here. We digitized these assets, um, enabled for them to participate in the quote, hardest market for DERs to participate in, which was a two second balancing market. So it's like frequency regulation in the United States. Um, so we built this, it was spec to support something like 2 million behind the meter resources being able to participate in a transmission system level, um, a, a transmission system operator run market for frequency regulation using the Energy Web Decentralized Operating System. And we are excited to continue supporting APG as they take this project uh, to the next phase. So hopefully that helps you give you a flavor of, of kind of how we're trying to bring this architecture to market. If I flip to the other example, um, uh, it's called Origin. Um, I I'd like to talk about uh, briefly what we're doing with our partner PJM uh, on the eastern side of the US. So PJM GATS, and I'm just looking at the, the pan, uh, attendee list, there's obviously a number of energy market participants who probably have hands-on experience with GATS. So it's one of the two largest renewable energy certificate issuance and tracking systems in the US. And uh, part of GATS is something called the bulletin board, which is a, a relatively manual or analog, you could think of it like a spot market for voluntary certificates in that region of the US. So what we're working on with PJM is migrating the current kind of bulletin board architecture to an application that's based on the decentralized operating system and is fully integrated with GATS. Um, so what this looks like is that um, certificates are authenticated using a similar architecture to what I just described. Um, those certificates show up on a, a digitized bulletin board and the way that that works is we actually use second layer tokens on a blockchain to show uh, this certificate came from this solar facility and is up for sale. Um, and the full history of any kind of trade or anything is then documented um, on a blockchain and sync with the GAT system. So this architecture that I just talked through in PJM and the previous one that I talked through at APG, those are the kinds of projects we are, are neck deep in across the world helping to bring to market uh, with grid operators and other market participants everywhere. And um, very excited to see what the next couple of quarters bring in, term, uh, in terms of additional projects and announcements in both of these spaces. So I think with that, I'm gonna uh, go ahead and stop and uh, hand it over. I'm really excited for the discussion. Great, Jesse, thank you. A great presentation. Uh, we have our, our third uh, panelist uh, next. Uh, Michael Russell from NREL, the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. So, uh, Michael, you can advance the, your first slide and the floor is yours. Thank you, Omar, um, and thank you all for uh, attending and presentation. I'm really looking forward to the discussion as well. So yeah, my name is Michael Russell. I am a data and software engineer at the National Renewable Energy Lab, um, and I will be talking about the Open Energy Data Initiative, which is a DOE-funded project through the Solar Energy Technology Office focused at trying to improve how uh, DOE and the national labs disseminates um, high value uh, public or high value open data to the public using partnerships with the cloud. And as Shuli mentioned earlier, um, this is one of the projects that's under LF Energy and um, we have been uh, very excited about our partnership with them. So what is the Open Energy Data Initiative? So this is, uh, as I mentioned, it's a DOE funded project aimed at improving the automating access to high value energy data sets. And I do wanna to emphasize that, that the focus of uh, OEDI is to provide access to data across the U.S. Department of Energy's um, entire portfolio. Uh, this is data not only related to solar, but to all of the DOE offices and data coming out of all of the national laboratories, as well as data coming out of academic institutions. So pretty much anyone that is associated with a DOE project that is producing uh, open data, uh, we would like to get it into um, OEDI. So um, why OEDI? I think that uh, as hopefully a lot of you on this call know, data is getting larger and larger. So historically, um, what, how DOE and the National Labs uh, open source data are provided to the public is that they created data repositories. So this is kind of like your Dropboxes or Google Drives or Box accounts where you just upload data and then someone can download it to their computer. This works fine for small data sets, all of our historical Excel models, 
but it does not work well for large data sets like our uh, National Solar Radiation Database, which is at this point almost 100 terabytes of solar resource data. And so it, we, we've really hit the point where to truly be able to innovate and um, push the envelope in terms of research and analysis on open data, we need to change the paradigm. And so OEDI is focused on doing that in three ways. One, it's partnering with the cloud. So we have de developed cloud relationships with, uh, right now we have a very strong relationship with AWS, Amazon Web Services. We're also developing relationships with Microsoft Azure and um, Google. And the hope here is to leverage their expertise in large data, in cloud computation, to uh, make access to the data a lot more seamless and also to uh, make analysis on these large data sets a lot more effective. So uh, the, the end goal here is to improve innovation, improve access, and allow for a centralized data lake, so an ecosystem where we can promote access and analysis. So what does that look like? As I mentioned, we're trying to flip this uh, data access paradigm on its head. So historically it was uh, put data up and then download it. So provide a way for people to uh, bring the data to themselves. We now want to bring the people to the data. So we like this analog of a lake. Um, we have data that is entering the lake from all of these different sources. And then uh, people are going to come and camp out on the lake and access the data where it lives. Um, and that will allow for, uh, in, in our opinion, much greater innovation. So by bringing people to the data, everyone's using the same ecosystem. Um, they are allowed to uh, more easily share their uh, analysis approaches. They can bring in their own data to the lake. Uh, hopefully they will leave their derivative products within the data lake to allow for other users to see what they've done. Um, it really is going to, in, in our opinion, greatly improve how we collaborate and innovate on, on these large data sets. It allows you to uh, munge multiple data sets together because they're all in the same place. You don't have to go out and try to find them, um, bring them together. You don't have to download them locally and then no one knows where all your sources came from and what you actually did. By putting everything in the public sphere, we're hoping that we can streamline this approach to innovation and analysis. So I want to give an example of how we have already seen significant gains by using this approach. So our two, uh, NREL's two kind of premier um, resource data sets are the National Solar Radiation Database. This is now a 21 year uh, data set of solar radiation data for most of the Western Hemisphere. Um, and then we have the Wind Integration National Data Set. This is eight years of wind resource data for uh, the contiguous United States. And historically, the only way to access this data was through these two web servers. So the NSRDB viewer and the Wind Prospector. These were hosted internally at NREL. And due to technological issues, they could only provide access to a very, very small amount of data. So I'm talking about uh, a handful of points, dozens of points at a time. You'd have to request a download. It would get curated on our servers and you'd get an email. Um, Great if you are trying to look at a single site or maybe the resource for a wind farm, not great for uh, actual research and really not great for analysis because you have to download it locally, um, you're, you don't have a continuous stream of data. That said, we still have significant interest in the data. This is a historical look at the requests through these websites. We're looking at um, tens to hundreds of thousands of requests a quarter for this data. Well, uh, what's the full scope of the data that's available? So uh, the NSRDB, as I mentioned, is uh, data going back to 1998. It's four kilometer spatial resolution, 30 minute temporal resolution, and it covers most of the Western hemisphere. Just for this data set, it's about 36 terabytes. Uh, we have also recently added um, five minute, two kilometer data for the United States for 2018 and 2019, and that's pushing this data set to close to 100 terabytes. The wind toolkit is even more impressive. So this is um, two, originally it was 2007 to 2013. We now also have data for 2014. Originally it was just the contiguous United States. Now we have all of North America at two kilometer and five minute resolution. This data is over 400 terabytes in size. And so as you can see, we historically were only allowing a very, very, very small fraction of the data to really be available to the public. And so by 
partnering with the cloud, specifically AWS, what we've been able to do is provide a platform where you can, you can access as much data as you want. So these are two uh, examples of me accessing data using our, uh, using the Open Energy Data Initiative platform. Um, one is downloading all 20 years of data for California to compute the multi-year um, GHI means. This took me about an hour to download to my laptop um, and compute. Uh, it was about 18 gigabytes of data that I streamed directly to my laptop. Another example is one day of DNI irradiance. So this is about 52 megabytes and it took me 18 seconds to download. Uh, both of these examples are impossible to do with the NSRDB viewer. It's just more data than we can, we can serve up. So we are already seeing significant improvements in just the amount of data that you can access, the sort of analysis you can do. Um, we're, we're really allowing access to the entirety of the data set, which was funded by DOE and therefore by the public and really should be back in the public sphere. Um, another example is that we've been able to build real-time web apps. So this WinViz tool is, is a fun little example. Uh, you can go in, you can pick any day, any hub height, or actually any time step, any hub height, and it will display um, the, wind, the, the data from the wind toolkit. So this is just a, a, a snapshot of Superstorm Sandy. The, um, the, the actual colors is the wind speed, and then these little vectors are the prominent wind direction uh, that's happening at that moment in time. So this is a fun little uh, real-time interactive web app that we're allowed to, that we're able to build now that we have access to all of the data. Um, so who are we enabling? Uh, this is a snapshot of who's accessing data through uh, the Open Energy Data Initiative architecture. Um, you can see we have hundreds of users a month um, across the NSRDB, the Win Toolkit, and we have a new historical uh, U.S. WAVE data set, which is going back to um, 1978. It's a, uh, it's a Hindcasted model uh, that has varying resolution with ocean depth um, at three hour temporal resolution showing the amplitude and direction of uh, offshore waves for California. And you can also see that we are getting downloads from across the world. So we have uh, significant interest in the United States, but we're also getting hits from Europe, uh, Asia, South, South America, and um, Canada. So this really shows that we, we are greatly improving the dissemination of data um, within our platform. So what are we enabling? Uh, I really think that, that this is the future of research, of innovation um, by providing the, da the, the data in its entirety in a, in a format and on a platform that has built-in computational uh, capabilities being the cloud, we really are going to be able to push the paradigm in, in terms of machine learning, research, and innovation within the renewable sphere. And that's really the goal of the Open Energy Data Initiative, is provide a platform that will allow better access for uh, improved innovation and analysis. So these are the current, this is kind of where we're at uh, with OEDI. We're finishing up year two. Um, we have one more year on our current funding, but we're hoping to uh, get renewed through DOE. Um, these are the data sets that are data sets that are already available uh, on AWS, the National Solar Radiation Database, the Wind Toolkit, this uh, historical US Wave data set. We have uh, a DAS data set from um, the Geothermal Technology Office, the Utility Rate Database, which some of you might be familiar with. LBNL is tracking the sun data set, and then uh, a PV rooftop database of LIDAR data, um, which I think we, when combined with CNSRDB is really going to provide some interesting uh, analysis for distributed solar. So this is the location, uh, the tilt, um, and the azimuth of uh, residential rooftops for several large municipalities. We're also working on adding LIDAR data for all of Puerto Rico. So when you combine that with the uh, historical solar radiation uh, resource data from the NSRDB, you can imagine you can really do some cool analysis on the availability and the potential for distributed solar. We're also working on um, uh, adding some uh, dis uh, distribution system data from Smart the SmartTS project. So these are synthetic distribution networks. The city's LEAP data, so this is uh, um, some census data that has been combined with energy data. Uh, NREL's High Throughput Experimental Materials Database, which is already on S3, but we're going to try to integrate into OEDI. 
And then the other thing is because we're already in the cloud, we can link with a publicly available data sets. So one example is all of NOAA's data is streamed directly to, uh, to AWS. So we can now uh, link into those data sets that are already available on AWS in the public sphere and allow for integration into the Open Energy Data Initiative. Um, and then we also have some new data sets under consideration and are always looking for new um, data sets to add to our program. So if, if you are interested and have data that is in the public sphere or need help with data that you, that you wanna make public, uh, please reach out and let us know. Um, so another part of OEDI is that we are, if anyone is familiar with the Open EI data catalog, this again was kind of DOE's historical way of making their data available to the public. Uh, we are completely revamping the catalog. It'll now be the OEDI catalog. Um, it is just been launched in beta and we will be integrating uh, all of the existing data sets uh, at the end of the fiscal year. But this is where we are gonna provide access to um, documentation, metadata, uh, examples, uh, code examples, repositories. It's really gonna be our, our gateway into OEDI. And I think that it is going to be um, one of the most powerful tools of the Open Energy Data Initiative is it provides a platform for people to uh, not only advertise and disseminate information about their data, but also um, uh, disseminate the, the truly important part of research and analysis, which is the code and analysis pieces. So what analysis did they run? What were the results? Um, what were the, the publications that came out of it? I think that um, as Jesse mentioned, in order to really push the energy spectrum, we need to have good open source tools. And I think that the catalog is going to provide a place to um, connect the data and those tools. So this is our current data lake. Uh, it's on AWS. Um, it consists of data on S3 that is being hosted through their um, open data registry, and then a bunch of cloud optimized tools that we've developed. So HSDS, is uh, our collaboration with the HDF group. This is their cloud optimized solution for HDF5 formatted data. We're also using Amazon Athena and Glue to allow for serverless database architectures. And the idea here is that by having the data, the cloud optimized tools in the same location, we can then push analysis in the cloud. Um, we are also working on expanding our data lakes to the other cloud platforms. So we're in conversation with Google to develop a data lake there that can help that, that we're hoping can leverage uh, Google, their Google Earth engine, um, as well as working with uh, Microsoft Azure to start putting data there. And the, the idea here is that we, uh, we wanna make sure that data is truly public. We do not want to require people to partner with AWS. We wanna democratize the data across all the available platforms and let people use the tools that fit their um, project or the tools that they're most familiar with and make sure that our data is available on all of those platforms. Um, with that, I will take any questions and look forward to the conversation. Uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me. These are also some of our resources. So. Uh, data.openei.gov is our catalog. Um, this is the documentation for the data sets that we have out in the public sphere, examples of how to use HSDS, and then uh, the AWS Open Data Registry. If you just search for NREL, you'll be able to see all of the data that we've made available to the public. Fantastic, Michael, thank you. And thanks to all of our speakers. Boy, this has been a powerhouse uh, lineup, uh, a and we've had a lot of uh, questions flying around in the chat and in the Q&A, some of those not visible to all the attendees. Uh, so I apologize for that, but we'll, we'll be asking some questions here. So for, again, uh, this is a great set of presentations and it sparked a lot of discussion. Um, you know, one thing that uh, I wanna ask a sort of an initial question, and this is paraphrasing one of the questions that came in um, earlier from one of our attendees uh, from, from uh, Phil Markham, but I'm gonna rephrase this for for all the panelists. And, and the question, and I'm gonna paraphrase this was, um, will the architectures being, suge uh, being suggested here, uh, you know, these uh, open architectures, allow us to select this as the future unfolds or will they constrain us to aggregate at a certain level? 
And uh, maybe Jesse, I want to start with you since you did answer that question in, in the chat, but uh, or in, in the direct question, but allow others to kind of chime in as well, sort of uh, philosophically, or is what we're putting here uh, flexible enough to allow us to uh, adapt to any future as it unfolds, or is it somehow constraining us in the process? Jesse, can you start that one off? Definitely, that's a great question. I think. Um... From the, I'll just answer first from the energy web perspective. So for us, we thought it was the wrong thing to bet on what is the future market design going to be, um, and what are future global regulations going to be about exactly what you're asking. Um, will you know the battery in my basement have an intelligent piece of software on it that is referencing some of the open source uh, data pools that were just talked about by Michael, and then determining what to do on a day ahead basis? Maybe, or is an aggregator doing that? Or is it going straight to the transmission level distribution operator? Who knows? And remember, even in the US, we're dealing with 3,000 different utilities. So everybody's gonna have a different flavor. So for us, totally flexible. Um, that This is why I think a decentralized identity-based kind of architecture for the grid just makes so much sense because you can architect whatever kind of uh, uh, complex puzzle uh, you'd like. That said, it, there are some things that we're constantly watching out for. Um, there is a kind of selection that's taking place in some of the ecosystem as we're talking about software and grid digitization. And that's more of a decision about open versus closed architectures. So in an open architecture, which again on the energy website we're really big on, any device can actually stand up and say, I want to participate in the market. And then different market participants can sort of permission that device to participate. A closed architecture, which also might be open source, by the way, but the language I think people should start looking out for with this question that just came up is closed versus open architectures. Closed architectures, not the case. Only aggregators are maybe able to participate in the market or only OEMs are able to participate in the market. I've even seen an architecture in Europe that just came out recently where distribution utilities are completely cut out. Um, so uh, I'm, again, I'm only speaking for energy web. But there are some other initiatives out there that are more focused on sort of creating walled gardens and effectively making a bet on what the future market design is going to look like. Great. Uh, Shuli, any, any thoughts on that? Um, <clears throat> so I really agree with what just you just said. And I, I think the walled garden is is not really an option. I mean, there may be particular use cases. Um, the, I think the way I imagine it is that, um, yes, we're going to need open architectures. We're also going to need open source. There will be proprietary solutions at 10, 15, 20 percent on top of that open source. Um, but that local conditions are going to require the capacity and the ability to configure things. Um, so um, I I don't see uh, closing. I, I I I really see opening. And I think that if you look at it from a diffusion perspective, and and you look at kind of what happened in telecommunications, what happened with cloud native computing, what's happening with the automotive industry right now, what's happened with the internet, um, what you see is repeatedly. Uh, you know, software eats hardware, meaning automation and virtualization um, get driven into the marketplace. I think we're in the very early edges of that. Um, and then open source eats that. And the reason why you want to do it is that you want, we, we need to change floors. We cannot continue to operate on the floor that we're on. We have to change floors. And part of that is being able to provide maximum flexibility and that those markets are going to change. If uh, Sonoma County, um, you know, just living through a disaster or multiple disasters, you know, you you can see that that is going to change the marketplace. And um, I think as the future unfolds, we're going to see that. Thank you, Michael. Did you have anything to you wanted to add to that? Yeah, um, so I completely agree with, with Jesse and Shuli, and I think the one thing I want to add is um, I think that we've seen in in the current environment that there is this, there's a lot of added benefit to crowdsourcing. And so um, I think that one of the things that we've been fighting at NREL is that 
there's historically been this approach of you want to keep as much information as close to the vest as possible for a competitive advantage. We are slowly seeing that even private companies are realizing that by um, strategically open sourcing data, they can leverage the vast experience and interest within the data science community and the public to um, freely get some pretty cool uh, solutions that are very, very much outside the box. And so I'm really excited for, for the open ecosystem. I think that we are seeing that there's, there's significant more upside than downside of trying to keep things in the closed garden. Great, thank you. Uh, Liang, over to you for the next question. Terrific, yeah, and I, I'm going to pick this question, which is coming first from the Q&A portal, uh, which also kind of echo back, echo what we have discussed uh, uh, almost like three or four weeks ago at the federal and the state panel. At uh, uh, federal state panel, John Lockner from Nasturda talked about uh, uh, New York initiative on the data platform, and Chris Irvin touched a little bit on the, the green button initiative, you know, 10 or maybe more than 10, 20 years ago, 10 years ago. And the question is, how can your efforts help regulator, regulators, like state, both state and federal, you know, be more specific is like New York Public Service Commissioners, which is setting up the data platform, help the regulatory stakeholder to underpin their transitioning to a transform grid and the guiding how they structure and the manager their data platform. So, so I, I, would I would start with, uh, maybe start with Michael, then let's go to Shuri, then JC. How's that? See, you seem like you, uh, you had a comment, so you go, go for it. No, no, go ahead, Michael, sorry. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I, I mean, my first comment is that I, I am, I hate the reinvention of the wheel. I think that we have so much lost productivity at all levels of society, research, industry, because we don't communicate, we don't share resources. And so that's really one thing that we are trying to push with OEDI is we are building an infrastructure that is fully open. All of our tools are open source. The platform is open source. We're leveraging open source, um, uh, uh, infrastructures, et cetera. And um, we would be fully willing to help other institutions host data as well as help them stand up their own platform that is a parallel or a, a duplicate of OEDI. And I think that that is what we need to do is instead of having everyone try to do things on their own, um, leverage what's been, what's been done. I mean, I am a, I always say, if you have a, if you have a, a question or a problem, um, try to figure out if someone else has solved it first. So that's what we want to do is, is provide an example of how you can uh, solve this open data ecosystem problem and provide it to others that are of interest. Uh, you know, I, I think that that's a great answer and I would even build on it and, you know, another level, which is I, I think the mandate of a regulator is to ensure that the social contract is managed appropriately and that open source is like the ideal um, platform and tool um, for regulators worldwide um, to ensure visibility of, uh, you know, and participation. I believe that the Linux Foundation has done well and where I think, you know, the nuance and the details becomes is really around the governance and how do, how do we govern these things? Um, you know, we can create it, we throw it over the wall, we can put it in the GitHub, um, but is there a governance that needs to be created for shared investment? And, you know, uh, Larissa put, asked me this question also um, offline and, you know, my response back is uh, I'm working working with a utility in Europe that is going to put their data into the Linux Foundation. And this is a substantial, I think it's like a $10 million investment that this country has made on building a data hub. Let's get folks together. Um, let's begin looking at these things together. And let's get the infrastructure folks engaged. Let's get, you know, AWS and Google and IBM and GE and the folks who are going to be building the private and public clouds of the future that are going to need to leverage these 
data platforms in order to accelerate the onboarding of renewable energies or, you know, or flexibility services. I mean, there's what we're trying to do is potentiate electrons and not lose them so quickly. Um, and, uh, you know, that it is a commodity and that's what we work with. The only thing I would add is maybe a macro and a micro comment at the macro level. Um, how real time are regulators able to engage with everything we're talking about right now? I'd say not even close. Yeah. You have uh, rate filings, filings for different programs, uh, many different processes by which different uh, advocacy organizations and other organizations come together to be a part of a public process, which is critical. But at the end of the day, regulators are responding to dockets and pieces of paper put in front of them that their staff are, are reviewing and providing recommendations to. When you overlay software on the entire energy sector, we can enable regulators to be much more real time in their involvement with everything we're talking about. Whether we're talking technical, e.g. Um, should we allow you know, a battery with one hour or four hour capacity to participate in the market, or we're talking societal, e.g. wow, all of these DRs are creating a lot of value, how should that value be allocated amongst uh, high income, low income, medium income customers? All of those questions can be answered and changes can be made exponentially faster when we have software and digital technologies overlaid on the entire energy system. So it gives regulators the ability to be so much more hands-on with seeing what's actually happening on the system and making decisions to change uh, the regulatory toggles. I'd also just one micro comment. Um, privacy protecting regulation is coming to the US. Um, it's come to Europe, GDPR, uh, California, great uh, precedent set with the CPA. Um, if you uh, regulators want to uh, effectively take that first step of really showing how customer data privacy can be protected. Um, they have the opportunity to do that now specifically with decentralized technologies. There is an immense amount of innovation coming from the blockchain space, but also the enterprise space. Microsoft made a really interesting recent announcement about how they're using the same identity standard we use at Energy Web um, to protect customer data. So the micro comment is regulators, you also have a big opportunity to step forward and use digital to protect customer data. Can, can I build on that, Omar? Uh, so um, I'm so glad you just brought that up. So I was having a conversation with somebody at one of the regional uh, security centers in the U.S., you know, the interconnection. I'm not going to name names. And uh, this one is responsible for a team of auditors that go out basically with pen and paper to um, hundreds of utilities in order to be able to assess the security. It's, it's how we are in the United States. States implementing SIP, you know, our security standards. But the truth is, is that if we had a digital bill of materials, some kind of a distributed ledger that actually identified what assets um, are, you know, wh what is in an asset and um, software bill of materials like SPDX, um, which is another Linux Foundation project, that if we had those things, the, these things could be automated and happening in real time. So this guy has 400 utilities he has to go through, but he probably only gets a third of them. And, you know, I don't know, like, what's true or what's not true, um, but I do see that, you know, building, it's not only just, you know, customer data, it's also how do we manage the security of the grid? And if we do not create some kind of transparency, uh, you know, radical transparency, that allows us to really know what kinds of Secure um, security has been applied uh, to different parts of the grid. Um, we're sitting ducks, so uh, you know that that's a huge area and opportunity for regulators. Great, uh, fantastic uh, uh, responses to, the, to that question. Um, I've got another question here that came in, and uh, it seems to be more so for Shuli, but others can can chime in. It's more of a clarification question. Uh, you know the taxonomy that you presented and you referenced. Um, how does that correlate with the uh, with IEEE's uh, smart grid interoperability uh, reference model? So um, the data architecture group is um, working very closely with the with SGIP and with NIST. I've been working with ARI, um, Gopstein, and 
and also working in Europe with IEC. And, uh, you know, when you're doing that kind of shuttle diplomacy, it's slow. Um, but I, you know, I think that what the goal is, and, um, and I've had conversations both at a national federal level in Canada with the energy division in Europe and uh, with the World Bank and also um, with DOE, that if we can begin to harmonize a uh, taxonomy, um, that this is going to help facilitate and accelerate um, uh, innovation because we can target in our investments. So, um, so the answer is there's always room for more. It's got a creative license and we are looking for people to participate um, you know, in the data architecture group and the functional architecture groups in order to take it to the next level. Uh, it, think of it as a source project. Uh, so uh, along that theme, maybe to Jesse and Michael, are there other um, organizations and initiatives, standards uh, or otherwise that need to be harmonized, to use uh, Shuli's term, uh, to to help make this uh, to help realize the, the, these goals. Are there other ongoing groups, or and is there a need for some kind of umbrella level coordination uh, among these various groups that are working on standards in their in their own areas? Jesse or, or Michael, any, any thoughts on that? Michael, do you want to start? Um. I was going to see if you want to start. That, that's a tough one. Uh, so I, I think that, um, yeah, so one of the things that we've been, we've been fighting for is, is just locally within DOE with, across the national labs is uh, to just make sure that everyone's on the same page. Um, uh, again, I just see in, at all levels of DOE, a lot of wasted energy with the duplication of effort to create duplicate products just through a lack of communication. And so one thing that um, our technical monitor, uh, Amar at CEDO is really pushing is trying to make OEDI uh, an EERE level um, kind of initiative. So try to push for uh, a, a single approach to open sourcing data. Um, another thing that we're really pushing for is, a, is, is kind of a, a single coordination of how we interact with the cloud, um, with our cloud partners. So currently every single national lab has their own kind of partnership with AWS and Google and Azure. And um, we really want to try to centralize that at the highest level um, to just reduce redundancy and, and inefficiency. I think from, from my perspective, the um, we have to integrate with lots of different standards, whether we're talking about communication protocols or different messaging um, services. So. Uh, again, we try and just be flexible so that we can integrate with as many as possible. I will say the um, we recently uh, Sunspec Alliance just joined the Energy Web kind of ecosystem, and uh, their focus on communication protocol and interoperability between DERs and machine to machine communication is going to be critical. And I do see a huge opportunity for a large uh, and specifically communications protocol to be centered around um, as we're talking about. Um, IoT devices signing cryptographically secure messages with grid operators. We should. There might be an opportunity for us to standardize around that. Um, I do see one area for global, truly global coordination and standardization on both a data model and a method for transacting, and that's with energy attribute certificates. Um, if you look globally, whether we're talking about renewable energy certificates in the U.S., guarantees of origin in Europe. Um, emerging new standards for things like green biogas, uh, a new generation of carbon offsets, any of these, again, broadly construed energy attribute certificate markets, <laughs> it is just screaming for a global kind of standard. And we think we have that with what we call our origin toolkit. Um, we're working with market participants across the world. I mean, just to paint a picture here, what I talked about with PJM, we use that same software in Thailand. Um, and we're looking at using that same software in Europe for other commodities, so not electricity. So there is a real opportunity to pull together specifically for energy attribute certificates globally. A little bit less so maybe for some of the um, flexibility focused applications, because clearly we have so many different rules and regulations. But um, when you start talking about these attributes that are fundamental to the way the energy system operates, there's a massive opportunity to set a global, truly global standard. Thank you. 
Liang, uh, over to you. Thank you. Uh, let, let me pull back the, the panel discussion a little bit, try to focus on really the customer DER uh, data, be more specific, like uh, the smart appliance, uh, the EV we're driving, the power wall that uh, Shuli's house has. And, and uh, uh, because the customer data also touch three different things, which is the security, privacy, and also we are talking here, which is openness. How do we balance the privacy, security, and openness? You know, what type of technology can help us to achieve harmonize the goal? Let's see how we start. Let's maybe start with Shuri, go Jesse and Michael. How's that? Um, you know, I believe that we really have to really <clears throat> I'm a little distracted because um, I'm, we're getting new evacuation notices. So I'm probably going to have to go in a minute. Um, so I think I think open source and distributed ledger technology in particular um, is, is incredibly suited um, for being able to address security. And I think that there's requirements on security on multiple levels. Um, there's knowing what's inside of a DER, you know, in other words, the, the components and, <clears throat> and um, concerns that we have about particularly things ending up on the bulk power system that have extraneous electronics. It's being able to make transparency there. It's about being able to make transparency um, <clears throat> with regards to the software um, and how it treats participants and 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 user data, um, and uh, and so I I think that we have uh, enormous opportunities. But I I think that if we solve this secure these security opportunities um, in a patchwork way, the way for instance we have approached uh, securing our health in the United States um, with regards to COVID. I think that we will be creating um, incredible friction in terms of our ability to really hit that 9% um, a year uh, growth and acceleration. So I think it's something that has to be done in the open. Uh, there's a new initiative at the Linux Foundation called um, Open uh, uh, Open Source uh, Software uh, Open Source Security Foundation. Um, it is building on initiatives that have been the core infrastructure initiative. We are asking all of our projects to badge. And, you know, and Jesse, I would encourage you all to adopt CII. I think the more we begin to have visible approaches to security with regards to our software and our hardware, um, the better off we're going to be, and we've got to nip this in the bud and, you know, start moving together in a coordinated way. So, uh, Shuri, I would, I would uh, really, really thank you for your participation in case and you are disconnected and uh, uh, drive safe and stay healthy. Okay. Yeah, Jason, thank, thank you. you. Yeah, thanks, everyone. Yeah, Jesse, stay safe, you stay Julie. safe, too. I know you're in, you're in a difficult place as well. Thank you, thank you. Um, I think we haven't gotten evac order yet, but uh, so I'll, I'll stay on, I think, for the moment. Um, I, the simplest one line answer to how to deal with data privacy uh, from the energy web perspective is self-sovereign identity anchored on a public blockchain. Um, for us is the killer technology combination that can deal with uh, Liang, the question you brought up specifically around data, customer data privacy. Um, and wh what do I mean by that? So, <laughs> uh, President of the US, Donald Trump, recently has been making headlines about some things going on with the Postal Service. You all staying completely apolitical here. Um, what did the US Postal Service respond to that with on August 13th? They applied for a patent to have a um, blockchain-based approach to identity management. Why is that interesting? Um, that is a way in which voters in the US could be mailed a document with a QR code on it and for in BitWorld, digital land, you have your own self-sovereign digital identity, which means it's yours, it's not controlled by Apple, it's not controlled by Facebook, it is cryptographically an identity that you yourself control. You can use that identity to then digitally sign the QR code that was sent to you, 
meaning you can then vote with a guarantee that no one will ever know who you voted for. We can take that architecture that the US Postal Service just applied for a patent to and deploy it for every single customer in the world that is using energy. And when you have that architecture at the starting point, you have immense amount of flexibility in terms of where data is being stored, how security is being dealt with. And I'm not the expert here. You don't even have to take my word for it. Go and check out everything having to do with uh, decentralized identifiers, a standard being put forth by W3C, the folks that brought us the internet. Um, again, Microsoft seems to be quite bullish on this if you look at some recent announcements. So I'm not the expert on that technology, but that is absolutely the base of our approach to solve exactly the question, uh, questions you were bringing up, Liang. Terrific. Michael, anything you want to add? Uh, Jess, that's a, that's a hard answer to follow up on. But my only comment is, um, one of the things that we have really been working with a lot of our uh, kind of uh, private sector partners on is the idea of anonymization through aggregation. And so I think that in terms of sharing public data, um, there, there are a lot of very robust approaches to be able to aggregate um, customer data to a level where you cannot disaggregate it down to find PII. And I think that going back to, to your question of how do we balance this privacy versus um, uh, kind of being transparent approach, I think that this is a way to do it. So if, if we can really push companies to embrace the idea of, aggreg of aggregation and dissemination of those aggregate statistics, I, I think it's a way for them to be transparent about what sort of data they're bringing in, what's, what sort of um, uh, kind of innovation and analysis is coming out of that data while still uh, maintaining the privacy of, of the, the sources of that data. Terrific. Uh, Omar, I will hand this back to you. So. Yeah, and we have just a few minutes left. I wish we had another hour. This, this is fantastic. Uh, just so, so rapid fire here, just on the uh, sticking with the theme of consumer you know, devices behind the meter. So on the one hand, You've all stressed and you've articulated very well the importance of, of open standards and, and interoperability, yet we see the emergence of, you know, proprietary ecosystems and, you know, walled gardens, if you will, you know, from, you know, with, you know, Amazon enabled ecosystems, Google and so on. So how do we, you know, harmonize that, the reality, the market realities in the consumer space of, of devices that we want to link to the grid? and. Uh, the overall need that you've all been talking about. Uh, just sort of quick reactions to how we can kind of get these, uh, these, these, these big ecosystems that already exist to play. Um, I don't know if Shuli is still on. If you want to, if you can take that, otherwise we'll go to Jesse and then Michael. Shuli might have left, so. I'm a little, I'm, a li I'm still here, I'm listening because it's such an amazing conversation. I am totally distracted though. So please, you guys carry on. Well, I, I, I had to start and Shuli, if you chime in, if, you, if you'd like while you're, where you're uh, still there. Um, I think uh, a lot of the, well, there's two things going on. Look, Shuli said it, open source eats some of this stuff. There are current market processes being done in walled gardens that simply do not need to be part of a business model, if I could be quite blunt. And so there is a fundamental conflict in some cases between what some companies are doing now and um, what they might be doing in the future as open source comes to the energy sector. That's always tough. However, I think the bigger thing here is just education. Um, with the stack that, that I kind of talked through, and I think this is also true for some of the Linux Foundation projects, there's an immense amount of opportunity for proprietary um, business models to thrive. In our stack, um, we're not dealing with optimization in terms of what is the right economic dispatch for all these different assets in terms of what is the right trading strategy for different DERs to be participating in the market, nor are we doing anything in terms of customer engagement. What is the best way to approach a customer to buy DER in the first place? Just those two categories alone, there's an immense amount of innovation that's still needed, and a lot of it's going to be proprietary, if I'm being honest. So if you were to approach you know, some companies that are infamously uh, walled off, like the examples you gave, I think it's important to describe what's going to be open source in kind of an idealized architecture and where is there, who's doing what is such a common misunderstanding in this open source space that the, the quicker 
you can get to razor specificity on this open source piece of software is providing this function. I think it's easier to see where there's opportunity for innovation. Great. Michael, any final work real, real quick? Yeah, I would completely agree with Jesse, and I'd go back to my example earlier. I think that um, more and more companies are seeing the value add of uh, crowdsourcing. I think that if you start to play in the in the open sector, I mean, Google's a great example with their uh, Kaggle competitions. I mean, they're bringing in the best and brightest in the machine learning world, uh, and they're, I mean, freely participating to solve cutting edge problems that I imagine Google is probably profiting off of. And I think that it's a really good example of how you can um, interact with the open source world and it and it just requires to kind of have a little bit of trust on both sides. But I think that there's there's a huge advantage to companies to, um, it's a high risk, high reward. And I, I actually don't think the risk is all that high to interact with the open source world. Yeah, I, I'd like to just add one thing really quickly, which is that um, I think at the Linux Foundation, we have seen over and over and over again, uh, hyperscaling of business models using open source. And so it's not that open source has killed businesses, and you can see this in telecommunications. When AT&T made a commitment to shifting to open source, you know, Ericsson and Cisco and Nokia all freaked out. And then all of a sudden they realized, oh no, this was actually better. They got to go out, you know, after business in a different way. It's allowed telecommunications to scale dramatically by virtualizing a lot of what used to be done just with hardware and manual. So I think we're in a very similar position. And, uh, you know, the, the goal is not to uh, cannibalize business. It's to figure out how to innovate and scale quicker. Um, so I, I am very optimistic um, that the Linux Foundation, you know, and and the work that Energy Web is doing, um, you know, that all of these things can be done in a model that creates new business for folks and creates the grid of the future. There's going to be trillions of dollars that are going to cross hands in the energy transition, and let, let's change floors though, and and figure out the the boundaries uh, of where we need shared investment. Terrific. Fantastic. Thank you, Shuri, Jesse, and uh, Michael. You know, your, your three organizations really, really uh, kind of pushing the envelope in terms of the open source uh, software platform. And uh, I, I want to piggyback one thing from Shuri's resume, which is, uh, you know, let's do together and uh, train, inspire, and um, not 10,000, a million future engineer help us to digitally transform the energy sector and the electricity sector together. So with that, I'd like to thank everybody attend this webinar and thank you very much for your participation. And uh, next Wednesday, we're going to have a conversation on transactive energy. Again, thank you, Shuri, Jesse, and Michael for your participation. Thank, thank you, guys. Great panel. Thank you. Very much, you. and I'm really happy to see folks. Bye-bye. Bye. Stay safe. Bye. Stay safe. Bye.